Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is an amazing audience today. We have 61 people on board already. Welcome to tonight's presentation on the birth of Renzel Pons in Palo Alto. We are fortunate to have Dr. Bob Siegel talk to us about his photographic forays into this unique habitat. My name is Arvind, and I'll be your host today. And supporting the program tonight are co-host Judy, Q&A moderator Madeline, and tech chair Vivian. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you, how many of you are attending a CNPS meeting for the first time? If you could raise a virtual hand or type into the chat box, we welcome your input. And if you would please also tell us how you heard about tonight's program. Um, that really helps us uh, focus our outreach and uh, publicity efforts. So thank you for doing that. For those who are new uh, to the group, the Native Plant Society, the California Native Plant Society is a nonprofit environmental organization. It has more than 10,000 members in 35 chapters all over the state, as well as Baja California. Our chapter is the Santa Clara Valley chapter, and it covers Santa Clara County and Southern San Mateo County. The CNPS mission is to save California's native plants and habitats intact by bringing together the best in science, education, conservation, and gardening to what we hope will be a native plant movement. If you're not a member already, we encourage you to join and support the work of the society. Membership benefit includes two fine journals and a scholarly one called Fremantia, and a very accessible uh, journal called Flora. You will also receive the chapter newsletter, Blazing Star, that comes out every two months. Some upcoming events. On Wednesday, January 13th, we have an, a talk on Manzanitas by Kate Marion Child. She's a published author of as well as uh, she's a very engaging speaker, so watch out for that. On Wednesday, January 20th, we have our annual members' night and general meeting in which members get to share their photos of their nature adventures and excursions. It's very popular. If you'd like to sign up, please visit our website and there will be a link to, to a sign-up sheet. That's Wednesday, January 20th. February 3rd, we have a talk on supporting biodiversity with native plants by Shelki Tao. Anyone who's interested in knowing how to attract more birds and more butterflies and insects and wildlife to your garden, this would be a very fascinating talk. That's February 3rd and on February 17th, we have a talk on the natural history of San Bruno Mountain. This is one of the really wonderful places on the peninsula that more people ought to explore. The talk is by David Nelson and Doug Allshouse. They really know the mountain well. It should be a really informative and intriguing talk. Know that when we have last minute late breaking announcements or events, we always announce them through our mailing list and events are announced on our website as well as meetup.com. So be sure to check those for late breaking events. You should know that the chapter nursery is open for business virtually. And this is thanks to the tremendous effort by nursery volunteers. They are propagating plants and these plants need forever homes. So I encourage you to shop online and there's a special sale going on some plants 
Hub Mountain Lupin, California Buckwheat, Howard McMinn Manzanita, Arroyo Willow, that's a tree, and Yerba Mansa, a lovely ground cover for moist places in your garden. Uh, you can pick up the plants either at the nursery or have the option of having them delivered to your house for a very nominal charge. All proceeds benefit the chapter, and there are t-shirt books and other items available for sale at the website. And the square site where you can uh, place your orders is given at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this will also be pasted in the chat window. And it is also available through the chapter website. So if you can get to the chapter website, you don't have to remember um, these addresses. If you're not already on the chapter mailing list, I encourage you to join it. Traffic is low, the information content is high. And once again, um, the email to, to send uh, to subscribe to is given at the bottom of the screen and it will also be pasted in the chat window. If you enjoy these virtual programs and you have some bandwidth, we sure can use your help to organize more of these programs. The basic qualifications are that you are comfortable using a keyboard and mouse, be able to switch windows, be able to copy and paste text from one window to the other. If you feel that you have these qualifications and you have the bandwidth to help, we'd love to hear from you. Please contact Johanna or Madeline at the addresses given and these will also be available in the chat window. Some housekeeping before we begin, please make sure to mute your microphones. If you have questions or comments, please type them into the chat box as they occur to you. We will be directing those at the speaker uh, later in the program. We expect to finish by 9 p.m. And the program is being simulcast on YouTube and will be archived there for later viewing. So on with tonight's program, um, I would like to um, say a few words about Dr. Siegel. Bob Siegel has been exploring and photographing the wildlife of this area for many, many years. In pre-pandemic times, he led those scented walks at Jasper Ridge and Anyo Nuevo Preserve. In his other life, he's a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Stanford. After this, after his presentation, I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of questions. So please uh, feel free to post them in the chat window. And now I hand off to, to Bob. Go ahead and share your screen. You have to unmute yourself. How about that? Is that working? That's better. Okay, excellent. Uh, here we go. Okay, so uh, this is my little panegyric to uh, Renzel Wetland. Uh, um, so first of all, uh, lots of thanks uh, uh, to, uh, I wanna thank to the, the, uh, the people who helped out with uh, creating this presentation and for the invitation from the California Native Plant Society. I wanna th uh, thank all the attendees, especially uh, relatives and friends. My only mother, my only brother are here. Um, and uh, I want to also thank Arvin for uh, making this possible. Uh, I gave a short presentation on Renzel uh, to the photographic group, and he subsequently invited me to uh, 
sort of repeat that and expand on it for tonight. So I'm doing that uh, to Vivian and Carol for doing the uh, setup and the uh, and the uh, advertising. Uh, I also want to thank my photographing nature students uh, for inspiring me. Some of them are here. Uh, special thanks to Dwight Agen, who basically um, essentially uh, introduced Renzel to me. Uh, and to uh, Atul, who basically introduced uh, this group to me. Uh, also, thank you to the people that I've met in the wetlands, especially Ellie, uh, who's uh, connected me with a lot of interesting uh, wildlife and people. Uh, Sherry Bayer, uh, who um, uh, published an article uh, with my pictures in Punch Magazine. Um, Rob Most for introducing me to Sherry Bear, uh, Jack Awicki for a lot of his inspiring uh, adventures in the pond, uh, and to Emily for her pond or for her wetlands. Okay, so this is me. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, uh, uh, I'm at Stanford. Uh, my primary appointment's in microbiology and immunology. Uh, so there's some of my contact information. And you can reach me at chickenpox at gmail.com. Okay, so. Okay, now uh, it's a great privilege uh, to be able to talk to you today. Uh, so here is the, uh, the, the announcement that was sent out in the Blazing Star. Uh, and <clears throat> I will make some confessions here. Uh, so uh, I Googled Blazing Star and I came up with uh, this, this plant over here, uh, which it turns out is uh, not a, a California native uh, and doesn't look anything like this. And then I, uh, I discovered this. So uh, I assume that's the Blazing Star that's on the, uh, on the uh, logo here, uh, and then uh, and then a little shot from uh, from Wenzel of a marsh wren. Okay, so the floor are coming in a second. Uh, so a little more way of introduction. Uh, you'll see this is actually a picture I took on my very first day at Wenzel Pond uh, in uh, in late uh, 2019. Okay, so the disclaimer is uh, that uh, native plants are not my field. Uh, here I am in, in a field of native plants, but it's not my field. Um, uh, and in fact, I'm kind of the black sheep of my family because uh, they're pretty obsessed with plants. And uh, in particular, my, uh, my son is very obsessed with uh, native trees. And my brother has been interested in native plants since uh, he moved to California in the 1970s. So that's been a longstanding interest of his. So uh, I do have some, uh, some uh, credibility in terms of plants since I used to be the Stanford tree. Okay, so. There's that. Okay. Now, uh, once I was given this invitation, I kind of went down a whole bunch of different rabbit holes. Uh, I guess the advertisement was I was going to show you lots of pictures of birds, and I'll try to do that as well. But uh, but I went off in a bunch of other directions, and people who who know me and who've heard me talk are probably expecting me to go off on various tangents. So uh, this talk will combine various intertwining threads of of my life, including photography, nature, walking, uh, COVID iNaturalist birding and schmoozing with people at the pond. Uh, so I have an early beginning as a photographer, that's me uh, by the Statue of Liberty, particularly relevant today. Um, okay, so my initiation uh, uh, actually comes from a class I teach called uh, Photographing Nature. And this is a group of uh, my Photographing Nature students over at um, Anya Nuevo. Uh, where I was also a docent. And the purpose of this class is basically fourfold, to enhance pe people's powers of observation, to, uh, to help them learn about the natural world, uh, to enhance their ability to communicate both pictorially and how to integrate pictures and words, and also to hone their photographic skills. Okay, so, and we also talk a lot about the role of the photograph in terms of uh, communication. Uh, and we talk a bit about uh, equipment and things like that, so. Uh, it's an okay phone, but it takes great pictures. Okay, so that's me. I carry that around every day. Uh, this is another version of my class, and this version is uh, particularly notable. Uh, first of all, here's Dwight, who basically said, oh, you need to go over to Renzel. So, uh, so I did. Uh, Life-changing experience, okay. Uh, and then here's a tool who was also in that same class. Actually, Dwight was the TA for that class. They were helping me out teaching it. Uh, and, uh, and then you can see he's also carrying his big gun with him. So, uh, so that's actually how I got connected. Um, now, uh, the most remarkable thing about history is that one thing leads to another. And so uh, those connections actually led to me being here today. So uh, now I wanna briefly talk about the COVID thread here. <clears throat> Basically COVID led to no, no travel, uh, shelter in place. Uh, uh, I, I typically walk the dish, Stanford dish loop uh, uh, almost every day, uh, but then it closed the dish. So uh, due to the virus, 
uh, that was after shelter in place. So that was a that's in full disclosure. Uh, and uh, and then we were looking for alternatives, places to walk. And then I had amazing interlude with a killdeer that I'll tell you about that basically sold me on the, on this place. And I started going back almost every day for a while at least. Okay, so uh, in preparation for this, I decided to look at some of my very first pictures I took, uh, and then also pictures some pictures I took yesterday and compare them. Okay, so day one uh, was December 30th, 2019. Uh, I'm gonna call this uh, REWEC 19, uh, sort of like uh, COVID-19. Uh, so, uh, so I've now uh, been going for 376 days. Okay, so, so here's a, a picture from the very first day uh, in the duckweed. Uh, and uh, one of the things that struck me when I first went there was the, uh, the chicory. I've always liked chicory. It's something that I had heard about, but never actually seen uh, until I got to California. Uh, and I think one of the things that struck me was the way that the, the, the tips of the petals are sort of uh, serrated like that. I just thought that was amazing. Uh, so that's chicory. So that's actually a picture I took on day one. And here's a picture I took on day 375 yesterday. Uh, so the chicory is still there. Uh, and, uh, and in the interim, I took various other pictures of chicory. So uh, yes, yeah, so it was, uh, it's a non-native. Many of the plants that are at Renzel are non-natives. Um, and that was actually introduced to the Baylands Nature Preserve. Uh, uh, so people brought it uh, and that's a common theme. Uh, it's actually, the root is used as a coffee substitute. Apparently has a similar taste to uh, coffee, but it's not caffeinated. And this is kind of a tradition in New Orleans that's used quite a bit. And uh, uh, one thing that as you start you, taking pictures of things, you notice all kinds of interesting features like the, the way that the, uh, the stamen curl around like that. So uh, yeah, quite, quite, quite beautiful. So that's chicory. Uh, another plant I took on day one uh, was bristly ox tongue, a uh, very striking plant. And, uh, and then here's a picture I took yesterday. Uh, uh, it's actually not supposed to be flowering now, but it seems to be flowering most of the year. So, and then a couple other pictures. I got some, uh, some, even some new species yesterday. Pretty much I go every time and discover something new there. So uh, this is a new species uh, that, I, uh, that I hadn't seen at the pond, or at least I hadn't photographed at the pond before. Uh, and I guess the birders, uh, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant Birder, but the birders call this a butter butt. Uh, so um, uh, so yellow rump warbler. Uh, and then uh, all the way down to, if you look underneath leaves, uh, you'll find some interesting things. So here's a gall. Uh, uh, and uh, um, this is on a mallow uh, over in the pond. Okay, so a description of the pond. Uh, uh, Renzel Wetlands is kind of a 15 acre freshwater pond. Uh, it is freshwater from treated effluent from the Palo Alto uh, water treatment plant. And there's a 12 acre restored salt marsh. Uh, and I uh, learned that the salt marsh is actually, uh, actually has salt water pumped in. So both the fresh water is pumped in and the salt water because when they, uh, when they did the landfill over at Bixby, it actually cut off access to the bay. So, uh, which uh, would destroy the, would have destroyed the salt marsh, including all the, uh, uh, the pickleweed and the, and, the, uh, uh, and the inhabitants of the pickleweed, including the mice. Um, there are trails, especially on the water's edge, and uh, the pond is divided into actually two ponds by an embankment with a spillway, uh, and water enters the pond from below. So there's a sign, uh, uh, you're not supposed to do uh, um, swim, wade, fish, uh, and uh, people bring dogs, but they're actually not supposed to, and so I got them to put up some extra no dog signs. Uh, it's particularly unusual when you see certain people who are interested in birds and have their dogs with them, which seems kind of uh, uh, contradictory. Okay, so here's some advice from a wetland. I uh, got this in the Everglades, uh, make a splash, take time to reflect, listen to nature, read more, be green, don't get bogged down and what's the rush? Okay, so here you can see a number of places where the water is actually bubbling in from, uh, uh, from underneath. Uh, and uh, this actually, uh, are places where the birds actually like to hang out because it turns up the uh, uh, the nutrients and so they can often find fish and different things there. Uh, now, this is a place that is actually, uh, we might call rewilded, uh, which is a, a concept I had only heard, you know, within the last year or two. Uh, and basically there's, Nothing about this pond that ever existed like this before. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not conserved. Uh, uh, it's not restored. It's. Uh, it's. It's. It's a kind of environment that didn't exist. Okay. So here is one of the 
creatures that people really like going to there to see. It's a little green heron. Uh, and uh, there's quite a few of them. And in the, the other wetlands that are nearby, like uh, over in Bixby and over in Shoreline, you don't see nearly as many of these. So it's interesting how uh, the, the, each of these different habitats has sort of slightly different features. So as I see it, you bring in the water uh, and then either the plants will find it, or I believe in this case, some of the plants were actually brought in. That will create a habitat, which will lead to animals being there and entire ecosystem. And in this case, I think humans are involved with both the, the water, the plants, the habitat. Uh, and then the benefit will be to uh, pretty much everything that's here. Uh, so uh, including the humans who get to enjoy this uh, habitat and the creatures there. So, uh, so here you're seeing some examples. Uh, this is a marsh wren uh, uh, in the, uh, in the cattails over there. So uh, a little bit of history of the wetlands. This is uh, Emily Renzel and Enid Pearson, who were both uh, environmentalists. Uh, and uh, Palo Alto purchased uh, a, a, this acreage from, the, uh, from ITT uh, in 1977. And this was actually, uh, th there used to be a whole series of different antenna. I think that this was apparently the place where uh, the news of Pearl Harbor first reached the mainland uh, was was through the the uh, station at the ITT station there. Uh, it was dedicated as a parkland in 1982, uh, and there is an the, the ITT two of the buildings from ITT are still there. Or, uh, and then uh, 1992 was uh, constructed the wetlands, and shortly after it was named after Emily Renzel. Uh, and an interesting bit of history is that there was a measure called Measure E in which two different environmental sides uh, disagreed. Uh, one said, you know, you need to keep as much uh, nature out there as possible. The other said that uh, Palo Alto needs to create a, an anaerobic uh, uh, plant for recycling waste uh, instead of shipping it out to other communities. And so uh, this was a huge fight uh, between the environmentalists. Uh, the, uh, the keep it uh, pretty group won out. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that with the, I, I hadn't actually heard about it, even though I spent quite a bit of time in the Baylands, and it turns out it's really only been in its current state for about a little over a year. Uh, I couldn't find out that much about this, but I did an interesting thing. I looked at the number of observations on iNaturalist uh, and looked at where they were, and it's pretty clear that uh, uh, if you go more than two years ago, there wasn't really a path around the, the ponds. Around the wetlands, and then, uh, and then, a little over a year ago, they actually, or uh, during 2019, they actually created the the uh, the path between the two different uh, wetland areas. And so, it was interesting to be able to reconstruct that history uh, just by looking at the number of uh, and and the location of the iNaturalist observations. And I'll talk a lot more about iNaturalist in a second. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, a friend of mine who's sort of in the know, I didn't put her uh, on here, but she basically said uh, the city did the renovation. It was after the dump closed. So basically the dump filled up uh, and they, they closed it down. And so they did uh, trail expansion and planting. Uh, and there were uh, some people, I put that, uh, I changed her wording there, some people who didn't want it messed up. Uh, and um, so it's it's actually gone quite a bit of uh, renovation within the last few years. So uh, this is what it looks like. It's, it's kind of humble looking. Uh, it, there's, uh, you know, the, the two small uh, lakes there, two small ponds uh, with, uh, there's a number of different islands in there. Here's one of the small islands in there. Uh, and uh, you can see in behind uh, uh, the pass going up toward Bixby and then over on the other side are actually the East Bay Hills. Uh, Okay, and this just shows you some of the things in the as in terms of the habitat. So, so uh, things are growing pretty densely at certain times of year. So here you can see the uh, the the uh, the daughter that's uh, uh, on top of the um, the cattails. Uh, you can see that here. I really like daughter. Uh, you also can find uh, the its relative uh, bindweed. Uh, so. And, and then of course, then you get the next level because you have the, uh, the insects that like the, uh, the, the flowers. Uh, okay, so here's, uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, it's actually changed quite a bit uh, over the time that I've been there. Uh, so the distribution of cattails, for instance, uh, will change dramatically. Uh, they is as we said. There's, you know, this provides habitat. Here you see uh, the the cattails. You also see a trail plant, and you see a nest of uh, of the marsh wren over there. So, uh, 
Uh, a lot of the plants, as we said, are invasive. So there's uh, there's thistles, uh, which uh, again the the uh, the insects don't seem to care that much about uh, you know which plants they're getting their nectar from. Uh, so uh, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, insect life there, quite spectacular actually. The number of butterflies, the number of dragonflies, uh, the number of stink bugs or shield bugs. Uh, and the interesting thing is most of them have gone away. There's not much there right now, but uh, I'm assuming that uh, as things start to flower more, as the spring comes, the, uh, all the, uh, the insects will be coming back. So. Um, duckweed plays a huge role in this ecosystem. Uh, so uh, I guess it can be a pest, but the birds absolutely love it. Uh, uh, and one of the things is that, uh, that both the duckweed and some of the other plants clog up the, uh, the flow of the water. And so this is, some, this is an ecosystem that has to be actively managed. It's not something that uh, you put it in place and then it continues to work. And I think because, because in its current form, it's only been there for a couple of years, I think the city still doesn't quite know how to manage the, the, uh, the wetlands yet. So uh, this is a ubiquitous plant there. Uh, uh, again, uh, my IDs might require some help from some of you. Uh, so quite a bit of that. Uh, in some, some times this can form a very thick muck. Uh, you can see there are uh, uh, snails in there. Uh, but again, the birds are uh, very happy with this. They see uh, many of the birds, just uh, uh, the sparrows and the and the gallinules just hanging out and feeding and kind of delighted in this whole thing. So uh, there's a ruddy duck, uh, kind of a remarkable duck in terms of uh, swimming so low down in the water and uh, both the coloration of its, its uh, uh, bill and many other things. Uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, first time I thought it spotted a uh, a uh, spotted uh, uh, sandpiper. Uh, and then there are other things there like uh, turtles and frogs and uh, pretty much uh, 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 a wide range of different sort of taxonomic groups. Uh, uh, the night herons uh, often will uh, pose uh, again on the, uh, on the, um, on the muck. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of fennel there. And these are invasives, uh, and the birds really sort of love this. Uh, as do the insects. Uh, um, so uh, quite quite a few different kind of beetles there as well as I was talking about. Okay, so so here I am. I'm with the California Native Plant Society, uh, and so uh, so I'm trying to break down. Uh, uh, interested in plants and California natives. And you have to think about like why natives, you know, and again, uh, I'm gonna sort of pose the question more than answer it. But uh, to help me out with this, I pulled out a book uh, that I use, a little guidebook. Uh, I lead trips in the Galapagos. And uh, I particularly like this book, but also it's even more uh, appropriate because uh, it's basically a book about biology that's written by fitter and fitter. Uh, I guess if you read enough, you'll become fittest. And one of the things I have in here is this little key to the uh, species in the Galapagos. And so I changed, I got rid of Galapagos and I stuck in the word here. Uh, and they break things down into endemic, endemic subspecies, natives, residents, possible residents, introduced, introduced pest. And again, the question is, you know, what's the difference between introduced and introduced pest? Migrants. Uh, regularly observed and occasionally observed. Uh, so uh, I think I've encountered most of these. But uh, so you might ask the question of why natives, and uh, and that that issue becomes very prominent when you think about something like eucalyptus, where Californians uh, are divided between those who say this, you know, get rid of this invasive, and others who say, you know, we love our beloved. Uh, um, uh, eucalyptus, even though they're not native, uh, they're pretty spectacular. So, uh, so it kind of, uh, uh, I think eucalyptus more than almost anything else sort of delineates this, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the grounds between those people who are, you know, going to be strictly for natives and things that are, have been introduced. Now, interesting enough, uh, if you take something like this, uh, this is actually taken in Renzel and, uh, 
if you post this on iNaturalist, it will post it as what's called a casual observation, which is interesting because uh, nobody planted this. Uh, it's, it just kind of ended up there, but it's a non-native clearly uh, in this area, but so is the eucalyptus, but the eucalyptus is not considered a casual observation. So, uh, so there's kind of these judgment calls. Uh, so here you see uh, this in iNaturalist, uh, like, yeah, this is the balloon plant, which is the the milkweed, but then right in the same thing, you can see thistle, which is not considered to be uh, a uh, um, a casual observation. So, so Randall is for me also like a microcosm. Uh, so you can think about lots of different things uh, just with this teeny little uh, wetland area. So, uh, and I recall the the quote of William Blake: "To see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour." So, uh, so I even got the wildflower in there. Um, I don't know whether it's native or non-native. Okay, so one perspective that I uh, that I like to bring when I go out in the uh, outdoors is uh, is a taxonomic perspective. And so uh, here we have the Linnaean classification system, which is kind of a uh, a rank order in terms of uh, more and more specific different classifications. So domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, uh, and uh, I actually have my uh, taxonomic chops. I just submitted my my uh, my chapter for the sixth edition, not yet published, of uh, uh, pediatric infectious disease on uh, classification of vir human viruses. So, uh, you know, so classification is kind of something I've been interested in a long time for a long time. So uh, that's that. And then. Uh, uh, here's uh, another way of looking at classification on iNaturalist. It has these different uh, groups of birds and, uh, and amphibians and reptiles and, uh, and mammals and so forth. So that's another way of thinking about it. Now, uh, the other thing that's kind of a hobby of mine is uh, looking at uh, sort of uh, birds from the, from the standpoint of their Linnaean order. So this is a talk I gave to the Audubon Society on keeping the birds in their proper Linnaean order. Okay, so... Um, and uh, why orders? Well, for birds, orders make intuitive sense, at least sometimes. So for instance, all penguins are in one order, all owls are in one order. Uh, so that kind of makes sense. It, it doesn't work as well for plants. It seems to me that like plants uh, work better kind of at the family level. So anyway, but here's my list of uh, trying to get a, a credible picture of every order of birds in the world. I even have uh, pictures of uh, eggs of extinct uh, uh, elephant birds, which we have up there. So uh, now, uh, oh, I missed, oh, I missed, there's one. Uh, I, I actually made a list, uh, I guess I hit it, of all the different uh, orders that you can find at the pond. And so you can find about uh, something like a third of these different orders there. And interestingly enough, uh, one order that's not even listed in iNaturalist as being you know, local here, even though I posted the observation, are the uh, uh, Cetacef mormies, and those are basically the parrots. Uh, and uh, here's here's a photograph of evidence that there are actually parrots at uh, uh, at Renzel. And while I was there one day, and somebody had brought their uh, uh, their cockatoo there. Apparently, um, they got this woman got inspired by the TV show Beretta, so she brought that there. And uh, if uh, here it looks like uh, I'm experiencing pure joy, but actually I'm experiencing utter pure joy. Uh, it was pretty remarkable, and uh, even posed on the Renzel sign there just to sort of establish where he was. So, so uh, again, you know, a human intervention, but there was a, a, a parrot at the pond. Okay. So lots of, uh, lots of, if we think taxonomically, uh, we might, for instance, think about all the herons and egrets and bitterns. Uh, that's one sort of uh, group of birds, a family of birds. And so here are uh, some green herons and some night herons and some, uh, here's a landing night heron. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a great uh, blue heron, uh, and it's just by that uh, island that I showed you before. Uh, this is a, a great egret. Now, great e egrets and herons are essentially the same thing. So these two are actually in the same genus, even though some of the things that are also herons are not in the same genus. So, so uh, you can't really tell whether you know what the classification is uh, by the name gene, uh, heron or egret. Kind of the same thing. Okay, and then here is a. Uh, you see this, uh, the uh, egret catching a fish. 
So you got to wonder how did fish get here unless people brought them, but some, sometimes they can get there on the, through birds. Uh, you can tell this is a, uh, a snowy egret because they have these yellow feet. That's the characteristic of uh, the snowy egret. So he also has a nice manicure as well. So, uh, and then uh, we can switch to another group of birds. Actually, we can actually think about this, this family. And this is kind of an unusual order. And this is the rail a day. Uh, family and the Gruy formies. And uh, uh, this is actually a bird called the Sora. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is a bird called a, uh, this is actually not at Renzel. This is in the, in the uh, San Francisco Baylands. Uh, and it's a uh, uh, California, it, it's a Ridgeway rail. It used to be called the California Clapper rail. And uh, this is one of our classic uh, in endemic species. It's also considered to be endangered. Uh, so you can see these out by uh, Palo Alto Baylands. I have yet to see any of them at the uh, at um, um, Renzel, but uh, but I'm going to actually be talking about the same family right now. So uh, and what you do see is you see uh, um, um, uh, ga gallinules. Uh, which you see here, and you see coots, which are also in the same family. And here's a picture showing you the difference between a gallinule and a coot. Uh, so they're actually in the same family, but they're uh, they're uh, in different genera. So okay, and this uh, this is the Sora, which I actually did see at the pond, uh, and uh, kind of a uh, uh, small bird. None of these birds like to fly very much, uh, particularly the uh, the the rails. Uh, so. And this is another picture of the Sora. So uh, everybody's always happy when they see a Sora. Uh, one day, um, a bunch of people got really good. The photographers got excited because they thought they saw Virginia rail, which is another relative. But uh, I got a picture and it was actually one of these. It was a Sora. Okay, so. Um, now, many of these birds actually have this unusual uh, um, tail that uh, all of the rail days have the, you can think of that as, Tail of days. Now, if we were to think about the different, you saw a list of all the different bird orders. What about if we thought about flowering plant orders? Does anybody have any idea of uh, how many um, flowering plant orders there are? Uh, more, less than uh, than birds. So for birds, we have about 44 different orders of birds. So I will pause while you guys can, some people might be able to answer this question. And uh, I will also take any questions before I go on. Okay, somebody's asking a question. Um, so far, I don't see any questions. Judy, have you found any? Oh, somebody has their hand up. Five people have their hand up. Oh, oh. that's about uh, where they heard about the talk, but I don't see any questions. Ah, okay. So I will proceed to talk about how many orders there are. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, Fifty-three. So it's interesting. There's about the same number, even though there's way more plants. There's about the same number of orders of uh, of plants as there are of uh, of birds. Um, so you could go. Uh, you could make it. Yes. A few questions have now shown up. Um, first one is: How did you get the cockatoo to pose on the sign? Well, it was a pet cockatoo. So uh, so the cockatoo was very, very accommodating. So the person who owned the cockatoo, I mean, it was, I didn't know the person, but they were just very friendly. Uh, the person who owned the cockatoo, you know, said, oh, you want a picture by the sign? Oh, you want a picture with the cockatoo? Oh, you like, anyway, so uh, yeah, the cockatoo was perfectly happy. It doesn't, I, I don't think the cockatoo can fly. So that's why it was, you know, it, you know, but it was, it was seemed like it was, it was quite happy to be on the sign. Next and uh, Arvind has a question. How did you capture a photo of a rail? They are so shy. Uh, you got to be out there with your camera and be ready. So so one of the keys about uh, photography is, first of all, uh, I, I like to say you have to be in the game, which is to say you have to be outdoors and walking around. Uh, if you want to see play, if, you, if, you, if your goal, for instance, was to get all the angiosperm orders in the world, you'd have to be outside and exploring. Uh, the other thing is you have to have your camera with you. Now for plants, the advantage of plants and mushrooms is they don't tend to sort of fly away and be shy and hide the same way. So, uh, so you just have to be, uh, be, be patient. So, uh, 
actually, the other thing that helps is uh, sometimes, but not always, uh, somebody else has spotted it for you. Uh, so you you know you 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 rely on the kindness of strangers often. And we have I see one more question. Um, how is Renzel Pond different from Baylands? I believe they're geographically separate. Is that not right? Yes, they're geographic. What a contiguous. I mean, ba Renzel is contiguous with uh, with Bixby, uh, and then it kind of blends over towards. Uh, um, over near Charleston Slough, it gets closer on that side. Uh, it's very different because uh, basically Palo Alto Baylands is uh, brackish water. So, so it's, it's basically salty, whereas uh, the, the ponds that I'm showing you here are mostly fresh water. Uh, and that makes a huge difference. Uh, and now there is, a, there is some fresh water in both the duck pond, but the duck pond is not actually an active you know, uh, ecosystem because there aren't really plants in the duck pond, and uh, and also there's some uh, influx of of fresh water into um, shoreline lake. So, but each one seems to support a different sort of um, spectrum of of uh, plants and birds and insects. It's it's kind of interesting. They're so close together. I mean, even within the Palo Alto Baylands, you find a huge difference between uh, different parts of the Palo Alto Baylands. Okay. Great. I think that's all the questions right now, right, Judy? Yep. Okay. Yes. You, you actually can get quite a few of the different orders of angiosperms uh, just in the California area, uh, probably even more than the... Uh, than the birds. Okay, just to give you a sampler of what some of the other things that are there, uh, just this is a, a bit of a, uh, a, a slideshow of some of the different kinds of dragonflies and damselflies that you can see just in a given day uh, over there. It's not moving forward, but yeah, so. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty spectacular. Uh, these are called saddlebags. You can see mating, it mating. Uh, you see, uh, uh, this shows you sexual dimorphism in terms of the color. Uh, one of the goals of, uh, you know, you want to challenge yourself when, as a photographer. So uh, one, of the, one of the big challenges is trying to get dragonflies in flight. Uh, so uh, they always, they, they pause for just long enough for you not to focus your camera. Uh, so, but every now and then you can get them. And then damselflies are, are closer related, uh, slightly different uh, uh, structure of their bodies. And quite, a, quite an array of different kinds of damsel of flies as well. So, um, and then uh, these are kind of a favorite. These are uh, stink bugs or shield bugs. Uh, and uh, you see uh, uh, very, very colorful bug, greatly underappreciated. Uh, um, different kinds here. This is one of my favorites. That's just flipping it upside down. Okay. So um, that's just to give you a little uh, um, sort of idea of the kinds of things you can see there. There's a lot more on my website. Uh, now I wanna talk a little bit about the island uh, biogeography perspective. So, so I teach some classes on island biogeography, uh, including some classes in situ. So we've looked at island biogeography of the Galapagos and of Tasmania and of uh, um, um, uh, I've looked at uh, island biogeography of, of Borneo and uh, and Papua New Guinea. So, so one one thing you want to think about with island biogeography is how do organisms get there? So how do the turtles get to Renzel or how do the fish get to Renzel? Uh, sometimes they get there uh, by walking. The turtles can actually, you know, walk from other parts of the, the, uh, the, the bay. I've actually seen turtles, you know, away from water. Uh, and the fish sometimes can arrive uh, as eggs on, uh, on, um, on the legs of birds. So birds scatter them. Uh, you also find uh, things like, um, crayfish there. These are red swamp crayfish and uh, they are uh, a huge part of the ecosystem there. So a lot of the birds uh, feed on these crayfish. Uh, so in the water there, it's hard to see them except for the fact that uh, uh, you, know, you see the birds with the, 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 uh, the, the crayfish, especially the grebes are particularly good at catching the crayfish. Uh, and the question is, why would they come? 
So sometimes they come because somebody brought them and sometimes they come because it's a really great environment for them. So I wanna switch gears and now uh, start on a thread that's basically an introduction to iNaturalist. Um, perhaps all of you are familiar with iNaturalist. If you're not, uh, I sometimes tell people that when they if start using iNaturalist, particularly if they are already naturalists, it will change their lives, okay? So iNaturalist, a little bit about it, it was started by uh, some locals. Uh, it's now a worldwide organization. It's housed at the California Academy of Sciences and it's supported by the NSF and a number of other uh, organizations. And uh, I'm just gonna show you some of the stuff you can get on iNaturalist. So this was from today. And as of today, there's over 56 million separate observations on iNaturalist. Uh, you see a heat map of where they're located. Obviously there's certain places that you get more observations than others. And they've actually recorded pictures and uh, evidence of over 300,000 different species. And uh, uh, in terms of people on iNaturalist, you have 170,000 uh, uh, people that are uh, identifying different things and, uh, and almost a, a million and a half observers who are sticking things in there. So this is, a, this is quite a remarkable thing. Now, I, I first started using iNaturalist when it first came out and I was completely unimpressed. Uh, and then I didn't use it for a number of years and now it just kind of blows me away. So, uh, introduction to iNaturalist, it has an expert system. So if you post a picture of an organism, uh, it immediately will try to identify it. It'll try to identify it at the family level, at the genus level, and possibly at the species level. Uh, and it's, it does a pretty good job. It's in fact a remarkably good job in many cases. Uh, but then uh, other naturalists will come along. Other people on iNaturalist will look at your pictures and they will uh, correct incorrect uh, observations, uh, incorrect identifications. Uh, so uh, so you get the two forms of ID, which basically, you know, like for a lot of us, if I pick up a plant, it's hard for me to know uh, what that is, but sometimes iNaturalist will be a great help in terms of figuring that out. Uh, it also is a way to organize images by, for instance, date, location, taxonomy, or lots of other ways you can just reorganize your pictures. Um, it's also, a social network and you get uh, you get to actually interact with people from all over the world and it becomes a challenge and kind of a game uh, maybe an obsession for some people if you see people who have uh, there's a number of people who have over a hundred thousand observations that are posted on there okay so uh, this is uh, shows you uh, the, the things we showed before now you can actually sort by the number of observations or by the number of species so uh, so this person here I don't I, I mean, I I've see them all the time, but I don't know who that is, uh, has identified 12, almost 13,000 different species as posted pictures, not identified, but posted. Uh, there isn't always a correlation between the number of observations and the number of species. So the person who has the most observations apparently keeps observing the same organism over and over again, which is, doesn't seem that interesting. Uh, now, some of these are actually people people might recognize. Uh, these are people I've hiked with uh, who live in the area. Uh, I know some of the other people also live in the area, but I just don't know them. Uh, so, uh, And then uh, you also, when you post something, if you post an image, you can also post video or a song sound or a sign like poop or, or feathers or uh, uh, things like that. You also need to uh, post the location and you need the date. Okay, so those are the key things that you need to uh, give to iNaturalist if you want to get a good ID. Now, a couple of other things is uh, talking about if you're gonna use this program, you can use it on your phone or on your computer. Uh, if you use it on your phone, you can get the answer immediately. Uh, it turns out that if you use it on your computer, there's a lot more, uh, capability on the computer. There's a lot more things you can do. So there's an advantage to the phone and there's an advantage to the computer. Uh, similarly, there's an advantage to the phone because it will basically get the location and upload it immediately as opposed to if you take a picture and upload it from your camera, there's a lot more steps involved, uh, but you often can get a better picture from your camera. Uh, and uh, so I, most of the cameras I use have GPS, uh, but most cameras don't, and I don't really understand why. Uh, and then I'll make another comparison between birds and plants. If I first post a bird, 
I will have a naturalist look at it, some of the other people on iNaturalist within, you know, sometimes within minutes or seconds, uh, almost always within hours. Uh, plants will often go unidentified. So there's, there's, there seems to be less, uh, fewer uh, botanists or uh, uh, native plant enthusiasts who are going through and looking at the uh, IDs for plants. So. Okay, now uh, I, here's one of the things you can do. I actually uh, look specifically to see what observations had been made uh, in, uh, in Renzel wetlands. So this is me. Uh, I have made uh, 300 observations on 130 species. I actually added a few more today, but uh, uh, so this is just an example. So show, you can look at it using the map with a little insert there. You can look at it with a, uh, a list. And by the way, this looks like the same picture, but one is an observation for the plant, which is mallow, and the other is an observation for the insect, which is a gall, some kind of gall wasp, but I don't know. I'm waiting for an ID on that one. Uh, and then here, you need to have a confirmation. So uh, I'm pretty sure this is bristly ox tongue, but I'm waiting for somebody else to identify that for me. But the birds will all get identified really quickly. So uh, uh, there's some of the birds. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so yes, this is sort of my information. This is the information for every single person uh, who's posted things on iNaturalist uh, from Renzel. Uh, so, uh, and then I, uh, and I even, these are things I just posted today. So you have some, some hemlock and you have uh, uh, some uh, common reed. And so uh, if you look, uh, there have been, uh, I, I've posted, something like more than a quarter of all the observations and I've posted uh, more than half of the species that have been posted on there. So uh, so yes, I've, I've put a lot of uh, observations in there. Um, okay, now we can also just look at plants. So you can, I can narrow my search. So these are all the observations. This is not me, but this is uh, everybody's observed uh, plants. Uh, it shows you some of the things that are there. Uh, so there's been 37 species of plants there. Uh, I'm sorry, that is me, sorry. Uh, it says one observer. Um, okay, so uh, now, uh, one of the reasons why I keep going back to Renzel uh, is because of uh, an interesting that thing happened. So so I, I went for the first time in December, that was be the day before COVID was, in, or uh, the virus was announced, the pandemic was announced. And then I actually didn't go back again until May. And that's because, you know, I continued to be able to hike at many of my uh, normal places. And then after they closed the dish down, I was looking for more places. And uh, so I went to uh, the wetlands in May. And one day I came and there was actually a, uh, a killdeer nest. And so that killdeer nest had three eggs in it. Uh, killdeer uh, actually lay their nest right in the middle of the road. They don't make a nest. They just lay their eggs in the middle of the road. Hopefully they'll be camouflaged. In this case, uh, the city of Palo Alto came on, put a little cordon around it so nobody would accidentally step on them because they're pretty inconspicuous. Uh, and there's the, uh, uh, the, the killdeer sitting on the eggs. Now, interestingly enough, there's only two eggs there now. And I was always trying to figure out what happened to that other egg. Uh, you know, did it, did it die and stuff like that? And later I figured out what happened to the, uh, to the egg. Now this is actually on day zero. So, uh, so this was, uh, this was uh, 12 days before that. This is the day that the, the eggs hatched. And so just by chance, I started going back there just to see, you know, if I might see the baby killdeer, but by chance, I actually was there uh, when they hatched and I was the only person that was there. So it was really fabulous. So, so, uh, so there's two eggs. Uh, there's now there's one egg and a chick. Uh, and then uh, as the, it, it happened in a way that really surprised me a lot. So uh, I guess from, from TV, I thought like the, the birds would peck their way out and stuff like that. But what happened is the mom just removed the egg from the, from the, uh, uh, the chick picked the egg up in its, in its uh, beak and flew off with it. So I now know that, uh, that if the other egg got destroyed or something happened, mom removes the evidence uh, of the egg. So, uh, so flew off for about a minute or two and left me alone. Uh, here's the, left me alone with the, uh, here the mom is removing the egg. Uh, with the chick. So that's just me and the chick. And the, the chick is basically, I couldn't tell it was alive or not. It's just this wet little lump of feathers on the ground. Uh, so, but these birds are actually precocial. And so within an 
hour. This bird is up and starts walking around. Mom never feeds it. Uh, it's it's not quite on its own. Uh, and this is still like within you know an hour or so, uh, standing up. Uh, and now the stare down every day, <laughs> this bird would stare me down like this, uh, which is pretty funny. So, uh, so I actually went back every day for the next 28 days and tried to get pictures of the, of the chicks. Uh, uh, they, at some point they would actually, uh, they appeared to, when they, after they could fly, they actually appeared to come up to me. Uh, so, uh, okay. So this is day five. Uh, this is day nine. They're actually born with, with pretty vestigial wings and so they actually have to develop wings now now the adults are quite good flyers quite agile but you can see that as of day nine it still has a pretty uh pathetic looking wing there so we can go back here there's almost nothing uh on day five so these wings are growing fast uh day 15 uh here's the stare down this happened almost every day it's day 17 the stare down uh okay so then finally day 33 they have these spectacular wings uh and they, they start flying off so uh actually it was interesting because uh again one of the ways that you that one advantage of birds over uh over plants is that when they fly away which is harder they actually often make noise and so they actually kind of one day i thought i wasn't going to find them again and i heard where they went to so they actually went to a different part of the wetlands um now Essentially on the same day that that uh, chick was born, another chick was born. Uh, and this is actually a pied bill grebe. Pied bill grebes almost seem like the antithesis of, uh, of killdeer. They make elaborate nests on the water that are floating. Uh, they, uh, they have a whole series of eggs. Uh, both parents take care of the, the, uh, the eggs and um, uh, they continue to feed the young until they're almost full grown. So uh, uh, they just hang out, you know, even after they can swim pretty well and stuff, they just let their parents feed them and they scream at their parents all day long, feed me, feed me. Now, as a result of this, uh, uh, I actually was, was invited to do a story about the pond uh, for Punch Magazine. So for my, uh, my, with my pictures. And so this is actually the, the story uh, and there's a, a whole, uh, um, article with different pictures from the pond. Uh, this is actually an insert uh, about the, the, uh, my experience with the chicks and you can see all of them together there. So, uh, okay. So uh, anyway, uh, I told you a lot about the pond and showed you lots of pictures is I'm gonna end with uh, uh, this a picture of fennel. Uh, one of the things that stopped me from going to the pond uh, was basically the fires. Uh, I actually couldn't take it outside, and so, uh, but it was uh, the, the, it was one of the places where uh, you could see the world sort of turning red. Uh, and so, this is actually the 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 fennel in the in the uh, red setting sun. Okay. So, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real privilege. So, uh, and I'd be delighted to take any questions. We there are lots of questions. Okay. Um, first off, we have um, what equipment and lenses are you using particularly to get the dragonflies? Oh, I have a, uh, a 70 Mark II Canon. Uh, and you just take a lot of pictures and you're very patient. And one thing is that uh, an interesting thing about uh, doing anything outside is that uh, you get to know uh, how the birds act, and that allows you to learn more about the bird, which allows you to get to learn know more about the you know the bird. Yeah, it's sort of this cycle. And so what happens is uh, dragonflies tend to sort of uh, hover in a certain way, and so you can sort of anticipate where they're going to be. Uh, and I think the same thing is true if you're thinking about plants as well. So you you like you don't expect necessarily to see a milkweed at the pond, but you do expect to see some of these other things, you know, either the natives or the invasives. And so uh, it kind of tunes your brain in terms of what you should be looking for. So uh, so anyway, I, 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 you get to know the behavior of the different birds and the different uh, insects. And do you rely on autofocus or manual focus? Well, for for dragonflies, because they stay steady long enough, I try to use uh, autofocus on them. 
Uh, so it's like most of the time it doesn't work, but uh, sometimes it does. Uh, I don't think I can manually, I, I mean, I started doing photography where I didn't have autofocus, so I got really good at that, but I don't think I could do that anymore. So uh, another question is how many shots does it take to get a dragonfly in flight? I know you said a lot, but somebody <laughs> wants to know how many. Well, um, I, I don't know, but you know, like it, it's, it wasn't like the one dragonfly that was in flight. I get, you know, a number, this one's better than that one and so forth. So uh, there, with, with, a, with a fast autofocus, if the dragonfly is either in focus or it's not in focus. So it usually works pretty fast. Uh, you have to have a, uh, a fast shutter speed. I can't tell you the actual number. Uh, anybody who's ever been with me uh, knows that I use machine gun mode. So uh, the 70 Mark II does, has a pretty fast shutter speed. So, uh, so you, you just click a lot of images. Uh, so I don't know, you might, I mean, I, I, even for something that wasn't flying like that, I would take dozens or hundreds of images. So uh, the beauty of the beauty is cheap. Of Remember how yes. expensive it used to be to, to uh, develop photos? Um, <laughs> I, I have students who are still aficionados of film and I can just say that I think photography is so much more fun now. You just can do all kinds of other things. And then, and then uh, the other thing you can do is you do, uh, you basically, because I don't use my phone very much, except for maybe for landscapes or graving a, you know, uh, a, a memory picture. Um, you also, you know, do stuff in the, on the computer using Lightroom or whatever program you want. And so, uh, so I think that's actually a lot of fun as well. And then sharing them. It used to be so hard to share your pictures because you know you'd have to get your, you know, either the, you know your 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 still shots out of the little packet or or set up your slide projector or whatever. It was just hard. So, so um, Arvin made the comment: there are many more plant species versus number of bird species, which makes plant ID more challenging than bird ID. <laughs> Uh, yes, but you would think that people would sort of be able to, uh, I did, this is about the same number of, uh, of orders. You'd think they could at least get it down to the order, or maybe the family. <laughs> uh, one thing that have, that helps with the algorithms is that, for instance, uh, it, it, the, it guesses based on where you are. So for instance, if you had, you know, a, a uh, you know, uh, a type of plant or a type of bird or type of insect, and it, it wasn't typically found where you were, it would put that lower in the algorithm. Okay. And uh, on a different subject, one question was, is how close were you to the chicks and did the other egg hatch? Oh, both eggs hatched. And uh, I, again, they, the two siblings, I don't know what happened to the one, the third egg, the two siblings hung out together, uh, you know, the, the pretty much, you know, fairly inseparable until uh, at some point I couldn't find them anymore, but that was after about 35 days or something like that. So the, 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 the both chicks hatch, both chicks did very well. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a barrier that's like 10 feet away or something like that. So, uh, um, so that's, I, you know, I was, I was outside the barrier, uh, but you know, I have a big lens. So, so I'm eye to eye with these guys. Uh, also, um, again, you learn, you learn behaviors. So a, a lot of, some birds are more concerned about uh, threats from above and some birds are more concerned from threats from below. So uh, a lot of times if you're low down to the ground, they don't seem to care that much about you. Okay. Another question is, do you use a tripod? Uh, <laughs> rarely, because then, you know, I'm carrying around a lot of stuff. The problem is, is that a lot of stuff is moving. Tripods are really, really great uh, for things that don't move, uh, especially if it's the low, you know, I have trouble with low light. So, you know, you can overcome that with a tripod. You can take a longer exposure, but if there's wind or if it's moving, it's, it's hard to use a tripod under a lot of those circumstances. So sometimes I've tried with the, with the, um, with the, the kill deer, I often used a monopod because I could just stick it down and because, you know, holding the camera up for a long time can be sort of heavy. So, uh, so the monopod was, was helpful. Uh, an interesting story is, uh, this is friends at the, at the, at the pond or at the wetland. So, so one day I left my, my monopod there by mistake. 
uh, and apparently somebody picked it up. And uh, so somebody said, you know, oh, I somebody asked if it, they, it had been my tripod, they asked somebody else uh, if they knew, if they asked if it was their tripod. So it turns out, uh, long story short, after about a month, through a series of different people, I ended up getting the tripod back or getting the monopod back. So uh, yeah, there's a community up there, so. Um, another question, describe your typical day at the ponds. How many hours, what distance did you cover? Oh, well, the pond is, the, the, the Renzel is little, so you can't get all your steps in just by going to Renzel. So uh, um, I typically wouldn't necessarily spend hours there. Uh, I mean, it depends if there's something interesting to photograph. So for instance, if that, you know, I, I, I might have spent an hour or two uh, on days when the, when the killdeer were being particularly cooperative, but typically you would go there, you know, an hour would be more than sufficient to, to go everywhere. Uh, that would be going slowly, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just not that big. Uh, and then sometimes I would explore sort of the, the peripheral area. So I've seen snakes and I've seen, you know, other things uh, sort of, if you get a little bit further away from the palm. So, uh, yeah. And um, did you make an imprint on the killdeer chicks since you were around them when they were hatching? Well, so this is the, so my, my, after they flew off, they flew off to the sort of the, uh, the brackish place where uh, area. So there's different organisms there. So once they, they started to be able to fly and I would go there and occasionally they would fly in uh, and they seemed to be kind of, they didn't seem to care. I tend to wear green and pretty much the same thing when I go there. So completely green. Uh, so, but that, that obviously now I'm there. I mean, you know, I have a big camera and I'm a big, you know, uh, big creature. So um, I, I, at, at some point I thought, well, the killdeer seem to have imprinted on me and they, you know, they'll come within like 10 feet. I don't, I don't have some of those pictures when they're full grown and stuff. And then I realized it wasn't the killdeer that imprinted on me. It was me that imprinted on the killdeer. <laughs> so I just kept coming back to them. So um, uh, back when you were saying how being low to the ground frequently isn't a threat, how low to the ground do you typically get? Oh, well, if, they, if they're hanging out like on the nest or something like that, uh, I will be lying on the ground. Okay. Uh, another question. What changes have you noticed with the season? Any cool winterish things happening there now? Well, it, interestingly enough, winter around here, especially this winter, because it didn't rain, um, there's, there are a lot of birds around in winter, but it, I've been surprised at how few... So there's very few insects there at all now. Uh, there, I mean, there's a few flowers, but there's there's very few uh, insects. And then, um, uh, yeah, I don't see any other things like frogs or turtles or you know all that seems to have sort of gone away. And uh, one thing is that uh, the uh, around the edge of the I should I should have shown a lot more of this, but there's a lot of uh, willow, uh, and the willow undergoes profound changes. So. So basically right now the willow is, is almost all lost its leaves. And so again, it makes it sort of easier but to take pictures of birds that are sitting on the willow. But, uh, but at some point the willow, you know, will obscure large parts of the pond. Uh, uh, so different, and then at some points the, the cattails will come, become quite big. Uh, so so there, there has been quite a bit of change. There's no duckweed there at all now. Uh, I don't know whether they cleared it out, but it, it used to be large amounts. I, I don't know if you can see in the background, that's actually uh, Renzel and alternating sort of duckweed and, uh, and uh, water. Okay, and this next one is a question about iNaturalist. I know the platform is new, but do you think that data from iNaturalist could show evidence for evolution of new species? Um, I actually is not that new, but um, I mean, it's it's probably, a, you know, on the order of a decade, old, but it's gotten much, much better. And the reason for that, I mean, I answer your question in a second, but the reason for that is that um, the number of the, the quality is a function of the number of observations and the more observations there are, the better the quality gets. So this is this kind of cycle where it's getting better and better. Uh, and also, as more people get on there, they're more likely to identify things quickly. Uh, I, I don't think that there's enough information to actually see sort of 
be really good for seeing evolution in action. It's really great though for uh, for looking at you know uh, e uh, ecological change. So uh, the way that species change over time. Also, there's a lot of historical records about. Uh, what species are in a certain area. And a lot of times those records are wrong because uh, they're based on one sort of naturalist going out and trying to identify things. And here you have a picture and you have a, you know, collective wisdom. Uh, so I've tried to go back and repost a bunch of my old pictures in Madagascar. And a lot of times people will say, you know, this creature doesn't live in that area. You must have the location wrong. Uh, so down to that level. So, uh, and they're, they're probably right. And I, you know, I don't give a specific location, but um so, so I think it's really useful for various research purposes. I mentioned, for instance, how you can actually see how roads change and how that, that pattern impacts, you know, the, the distribution of different organisms. Uh, so I suspect you could probably detect the pandemic, you know, based on the, the, the change in the movement of people and things like that. But, but it's, as far as, you know, evolution, uh, it's, it's, this is what's called citizen science. So it's not, it, a lot of times it's just, it, the virtue of it is having huge quantities of information. That's, that's where it actually benefits. Uh, and just for a point of information, uh, Sonny Mencher said that doing the figure eight loop around the ponds is approximately one mile. And we had a question about, do you have a website, which is a little ambiguous. So we have your website um, in the chat and Judy put in our chapter website as well. So um, there's So let me, let me, uh, I, I don't know if it's worth doing this, but uh, I will try to do. Um, I think you have I'll to stop to, share and then share I another. I did, I'm gonna share a screen. Let's see if we can do this. Uh, share your, a different uh, window. Yep, uh, we'll see if we can do this. Uh, this will work. Uh, Okay, so, so my website is organized in kind of a mostly for myself in a weird way. Hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, so this is kind of my personal page. It's not very updated, but here is my photo page, which is frequently updated. Uh, and this has basically thousands of sub pages. Uh, and you can just sort of click, you can click on any of these links or you can click on a number uh, or you can just do a search command like control you know, uh, F and do a find. So for instance, uh, you could, uh, here's, here's Renzel. And basically it's, it's organized by, uh, you know, birds and, uh, and uh, different creatures. So here's slime molds. Okay, so, so uh, let's see if that'll work. Sometimes the links don't work as, uh, maybe not. Uh, uh, so the slime mold link didn't work, but there are slime molds there. Uh, um, Here's, here's where the, uh, when it got really, really orange uh, from the smoke. Uh, let's see the slime balls. Yes, oh. the orange Wednesday. Uh, yeah, it was pretty awful. Uh, okay, so here's, uh, yeah, this is uh, dog vomit slime mold over here. So uh, uh, it's, it's often in wood chips. That's how it gets brought in there. So anyway, this is pretty extensive site. So I don't know if does somebody have a favorite organism. <laughs> Kill deer. What? Kill deer. Kill deer. Okay, well, kill deer is easy. So, so I'm going to go back to my. This is my page. Uh, so I'm going to just search on kill deer. Uh, so here are all the, and they're organized by. Uh, so here you can see some more of the the uh, the pictures. This is before they got uh, born. Those are some of the same ones you saw. They do this uh, little um, uh, thing where they try to lure you away from the nest. Three eggs. Um, anyway, so this is this is when they. Um, anyway, so there's lots and lots of pictures there. So how about, uh, let's see if you do, do a favorite plant. Let's see if I can do that. Pickle weed. Pickle weed. Okay. Pickle weed. Pickle. Well, that didn't spell pickle correctly, but pickle weed. Okay. Here we go. Oh, it's in the amaranth family. 
Yep, so you can tell what family there are, which is kind of cool. Anyway, so I have a lot more pickleweed. I haven't uploaded all of it, but there's a good some good examples. So. Yep, okay, so that's my website. There's lots and lots of stuff there. You can see more of the pictures from the pond. Uh, this is all by, uh, let's see, I have uh, um, 42 families out of 63 I have depicted there. We are now out of questions. Um, <laughs> I want to say there's a I've, lot I've exhausted everybody. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of very um, kind and excited comments in the chat. So we will send my you mother. <laughs> no, just kidding. And it's uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you to all of you for listening and uh, and for your great questions. And uh, yeah, so I hope to see you out at the pond. Thanks, Bob. Oh, we got one more question came in at the last minute. Do we have time for that, Madeline? I think, you know, sure. Bob, can you take one more? Sure. Okay, what do you think That's are the right. do you, what do you think are the keys? Oh, two more. Okay, what do you think are the key success factors that contributed to the wild rewilding of this particular pond? Well, I, I think they were surprised uh, at how successful it was. Uh, and so, uh, but I, I, I think it's the, you know, basically the presence of fresh water and the movement of the water and also the proximity of other types of ecosystems, like the fact that the killdeer can go from the fresh water and go over to go to the brackish water. Uh, so, but, uh, but I, I don't think, you know, people have actually studied and I think that, you know, I, there has been some interviews that said that people were surprised at how very successful it was. Now, uh, there's a, there's a similar situation. I grew up in South Florida and there's a, there's a basically a wetland that I go visit there. That's, that's, it's bigger than this, but it's still fairly small uh, and it's called Green K. And, uh, and again, South Florida has a more sort of diverse ecosystem, but it's amazing to me what's there. I don't know whether people brought in the alligators and all the, you know, the turtles and all that other stuff, but, uh, but also how the birds just kind of find these places and know where to go. So, uh, so it's another example of something that is completely artificial, but wildly successful ecosystem. Now, in that case, I don't, this, this one is going to have to be managed a lot because in between the two ponds, which are at different levels, uh, are these basically uh, pipes, and the pipes keep getting clogged up. And so I don't think they've figured out how to have this be self-maintaining. Uh, and so, uh, so I think it's, this is very much of an experiment and a work in progress, particularly since they put in the crosswalk. And one more question, I think, yes. Um, are you going to be teaching your photography class again soon? I typically teach it in the fall. So uh, I don't have any plans to teach it before the fall, but uh, yeah, I can, let, I, can, I can let you know for the newsletter if it's coming up again, but probably will be in the fall. Oh, that would be great. We'd love to put that in the newsletter. Okay. Uh, fingers crossed, in-person classes. Oh, yes. We're, after we're all vaccinated. Yes. I'm wearing a, my, my tie is actually a, a, a virus vaccine uh, tie. It has a, uh, uh, it's actually got even a syringe there somewhere on it, uh, but it has, anti, it has a virus with antibodies. Hard to see a little bit, so. Maybe not. Over to you, Arvind. <laughs> it's great. Looks cool. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Bob. And thank you to everyone who attended. We had a really phenomenal crowd. I noticed looking at it, about 90 plus people could have been more. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Hi, hi Laurie. Hey, Alan. <laughs> hi, Deb. And reminders that this talk will be available on YouTube hey, uh, in a day or so. Hey, John. It, yeah, well, we have we have people from from the East Coast. Uh, we have all kinds of people here, students of mine. Actually, we have uh, somebody from Singapore. Uh, so you should get demographics. This would be. <laughs> I don't think Kim does that yet. We'll have to take your word for it. 
I people. What some of? The... <laughs> hey, Kathy. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Uh, I think, but I think we'll probably end the YouTube flow now. So. Um, All right. Streaming. Thanks very much. Thanks for a terrific <laughs> fun night, fun Friday night. That's great. Take care. Hi, Sherry. <laughs>